so let me first uh, recap a little bit of what happened last time. So we introduced the notion of what it means for an affine scheme over a ground field K. So this ground field is always assumed to be algebraically closed of characteristic zero. Um, so our, when I say scheme, I will mean a derived scheme and we will all be always be talking about um, derived schemes of what I call almost a finite type. So let me not go into the definition of that. So we defined what it means for such f s to be quasi-smooth. And what it meant is that if we take its tangent fibers, so they will live normally in uh, non-negative cohomological degrees, and we want that so these cohomologies be zero for i great, greater than two. So in this case, we can define point-wise support of coherent sheaves. So if f was a coherent sheaf, and again, when I say that, I mean bounded complex with coherent cohomologies, so, and s is a point, so we define the singular support at s of f as follows. So, we said that in our circumstances, the algebra, commutative algebra, sim, of the first cohomology of our tangent fiber acts on, viewed as a graded algebra, where the generator sits in degree two, acts on this graded vector space and this is just the support. So it's support of this graded module over this graded algebra. So the whole algebra might be closed field but this is zero? Yes. And so the support lives in the vector space dual to vector space of which we took the sim. And so it lives inside, so, well, take H1, the tangent fiber dual, i.e. it's the minus first cohomology of the cotangent fiber. So that was our point-wise definition, and as Lumon asked, so how do you ever get a handle on this? It's so theoretical. But so in a minute, I'll give you kind of a couple of practical definitions of this thing. Let me just finish this re recapitulating the story. So we defined a classical scheme, sing of S, to be spectrum over the classical scheme underlying S, so kill all the lower cohomologies, spec sim of H1 of Ts. So this is the tangent sheaf. You consider it's H1, it's a coherent sheaf on the classical S, take its sim. And so set theoretically, that looks like the union over all points of these guys of minus first cohomologies of the cotangent fibers. And then we said, okay, so we have these point-wise supports. So to F, we can assign singular support of F, which is a subset in the sing. So in the proposition uh, is that it's closed. is the risk closed. So in the next talk, I will give yet a different definition of single support, which will make, which will make such claims obvious. So for now, I'm just stating it.
And so there was one essential result that I quoted last time that said the following, that so the singular support of f is contained in the zero section if and only if f is perfect. So single support really detects the measure of imperfection of s. Okay, so now consider an example and a very kind of hands-on definition of single support. And then I will give yet another definition of single support. Okay, so here's another example. So let u be a smooth uh, variety equipped with a function. And say this function is non-zero. So let's take the zero set of this function. So this is your it's a hypersurface. And it's given as a complete intersection. So this is a classical scheme, but it's also quasi-smooth derived scheme. We said last time that locally complete intersections are exactly those quasi-smooth derived schemes that happen to be classical. So let's say in this case what sing of s looks like. Well, I gave a general criterion, well, general description of sing s in, in these circumstances. So we look, we're looking at the, well, co-differential of this map. So it's kind of df star. Of course, the cotangent bundled to a1 is a1. So this is really a map from OS into this vector bundle. And so and it's the kernel of this map. i.e. it looks as follows. So at a given point, so at a given point, it looks as follows. It's zero if df at s is not equal to zero and is one dimensional if um, so the function is degenerate at this point. And so and there is not much room for singular support. Well, according to this theorem, what you have is that, so, well, all I can say is just to restate this in this case, that um, singular support at a given point will be zero if and only if f is perfect on the risky neighborhood of this point. <coughs> so in the case of hypersurfaces, Single support is either zero or everything. So you mean it will be zero or empty because it has a zero. Uh, yeah, for zero we discussed this last time. <laughs> okay, let me say non-zero. Be non-zero, and then if and only if is not perfect. Oh no, it is the empty set. <laughs> No, no, so non-zero means that in excluding, excluding empty set and zero. I'm saying that you will hit this k if and only if you actually are imperfect at that point. Imperfect, zero is perfect. All right, so now what I want to, I want to generalize this example, well, to a general situation. So we said that in general, a quasi-smooth scheme can always be fit into a Cartesian square where u and v are smooth classical schemes. So the Cartesian square is taken in the derived sense. So, and parallel to this, so 
sing of s is the kernel of the map from t star v restricted to s to t star u restricted to s. So this is the dual of the differential. So I want to give a criterion, and let's notice the following. So let me introduce a piece of notation. So let me call the straight V the tangent space to this curly V at the point. And so what you see is that this always sits inside V star times S. So very concretely, the singular support will live in the S times the dual vector space well, to the cotangent fiber to my V at the point. So now very concretely, I want to say when an element here belongs to the singular support. So let me take Xi, an element of V star, and want to say when a pair um, S comma Xi belongs to the singular support of a given sheaf. And so here's the procedure kind of that is due to Drinfeld. And you may, so there's some vague analogy with uh, vanishing cycles. So its analogy is really vague, but well, OK, so here's what you do. Well, here, let me rewrite this again. Now choose a function on this v whose differential at your chosen point is, um, is xi. So this is my h and this is my f. So df at my point is xi. OK, and so and, and vanishes at the point. So let me denote this by v prime. Let me denote this by the preimage by S prime. So this, my, this was my old point, and this is my S. So if you wish, S was the set, was the set of zeros of the map H, and S prime is a much larger closed subscheme. It's the set of zeros of the composed map. H, there is no, no, no what are the hypotheses? Um, H? None. Abs absolutely none. Oh, and V are just smooth. Just smooth. Yeah, the two guys are smooth and H is absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. Uh, yeah. And those guys are the high. No, uh, you mean these guys? No, the S prime and S are yeah. derived. Yeah, so S and S prime are derived. Well, F, so S, well, but in fact, um, yeah, S, both, both guys are derived. But note that Note, however, that S prime is a hypersurface because S prime, S prime is zeros of this composed map. It may happen that this map is zero, but it's okay. We're still. In fact, when we discuss this hypersurface situation, it's just as well applicable to the case where the function was zero. Why not explain things like in coordinates? We get just collection of functions and some coordinates. You know, you know, it's abstract notation. So you know, it's uh, let me do it and then maybe I'll let you do it because I can, I'll, I'll get confused when I write coordinates. But okay. So all I mean is just well, create this diagram and S prime is the hypersurface. Let me denote this closed embedding by I. So and here is the theorem is that so this belongs to the singular support. if and only if the following happens. So you have your coherent sheaf here, take its direct image, you get a coherent sheaf here, and what you want is that this guy be imperfect. So, pardon? In the neighborhood, In the neighborhood yes. So it belongs to this if is not perfect, 
on S prime on the risky neighborhood. So if you regard perfection as an analog of the property of elliptic sheaves being lease, uh, then you can detect uh, singular support by this property, but not on the initial scheme, but on a kind of a bigger guy, the hypersurface. I don't know. I know stuff can in the derived thing can be complicated. Or? No, no, no. It's um, no. It's just, it's no complications here. It's just under closed embedding. Nothing happens there. So it's kind of so it's a morphism of spaces with a DG differential bonded ring, something like this. Yeah, but it's direct. And you it's, take that the naive direct image. It's, yeah, it's absolutely yeah. It's direct image is direct image. It's to have a map of rings, and you just it's a forgetful functor under the map of rings. Whatever you use, if you use simplicial differential, okay, enough, yeah, nothing see. happens particularly. Yeah, so this is the most naive functor, so no, no complications here. All right, so so now I'm facing, well, it's not a dilemma, so I'm, I want to give you yet another definition of single support, which is very calculable. It's, it's a little bit complicated. So please bear with me. And if you don't like it, just erase the next five minutes from your memory. You, you just, it, it may not be so nice. So if you prove this theorem, if we follow that the single support is closed. So. Well, the order of proofs is, is not as presented. You, you can prove this. I'm not giving these theorems in the order in which they are proved. Okay. And to prove it all, you have to start with the yet another definition, which I'll, give, which I'll give next week. So the kind of the ultimate definition is via Hochschild co-chains. I just don't want to throw them at you right now. But we'll do it next week. All right. So, um, okay. So here is the... So let's call it the Drinfeld definition, and I'll give you a Kozul definition. So we will, we are still in this situation, so this uh, situation of complete intersection. And so now I introduce a, an object that has already appeared. I call it GV. It's point times point over V. We've seen this guy before. And um, we even said that, so co of this GV, G, was modules over the following algebra. So let's say perfect modules. V, I remind you, is the tangent space to this curly V at the point. Okay, so now just notice that, well, it's a groupoid over the point, kind of by definition. You draw. Now, groupoids over a point are groups. So it's actually a group object in the category of derived schemes. And moreover, this group object acts on our, on our S. So namely, you can draw this diagram, you can draw... When you say the category of derived schemes, you are cheating a little with infinity categories or... <laughs> Also. Yes, so I have tacitly passed to our new world. So we have this infinity category of derived schemes in that, in this category, the notion of a group object. Okay. 
Yes, S is our S. Uh, no, but this is the same picture. Yeah, 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 yes. I'm referring to this picture. So if you wish, this groupoid that acts on a point lifts to a groupoid. So this both square is a Cartesian. Acts, lifts to a groupoid on S. And in other words, we say that this group acts on S. The group G v acts on s and let's denote by act the action map now here is what you do and remember i said that our singular support is a subset in v star times s you start with an object On S, you lift it by means of the action to here. And then you apply this, well, this is, this equivalence is what I call causal duality along the second variable, the first variable. So you go from here to a module and then you take its support. So the theorem is that singular support of F equals the support of, well, causal duality applied to act upper star of F as a subset inside S times V star. So when you actually need to compute something, you use this definition. So if I were to see it the first time, I would be completely baffled. Oh, how do you what is this action? How do you compute these things? So maybe don't worry about it right now. I just wanted to give you a perspective how to compute things. Okay. Do you have an example of, uh, of non-zero non support? Just a case that we can see. Oh yeah, we, we, we saw this example, right? Um, yeah, so we saw it like at the end of last time and I'll come back to it in a moment. Yeah. So, for classical scheme. Yes, yes. Now you have singular hypersurface. Yeah, yeah. I take a coherent shift off point, which is not, yeah, not perfect. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes. No, but where you get a cone in a higher dimension, I mean, because here it's either zero or. Uh, yes, we saw the example of this particular, so I remember last time, of this guy. And so we said that this category is equivalent to this. And so, for example, if you take the skyscraper, you will get the module which equals the entire algebra, it supported everything. So yeah. there, there is a, a, all the cone, all the cone. Oh, and then you can, so then there are all the intermediate cases. Take any object here. No, but there is no constraint on the cone. You can Absolutely none. Take any, any object, take, pick a cone, yeah, okay. pick any object supported in it, apply the inverse equivalence, and you, and you got it. Okay, so so in the next talk, I'll 
well, I'll give the ultimate definition of singular support and prove various properties. So these, to prove these properties, it's inconvenient to stay with coherent sheaves. And so th this is the next step that I want, the next procedure that I want to apply. So, So we said that if C was a co-complete triangulated category, you can define the subcategory C with little c of compact objects. So the claim is that in most of the practical cases this subcategory retains basically the same information as C. And in fact there is an inverse procedure that I will explain right now. The only problem for the inverse procedure that, well, you really have to abandon the, the old world. You cannot stay with in the world of triangulated categories. You need to work with DG categories. So if you start with a DG category C0, you can produce a new one, it's called the int completion. So basically, so I'll characterize it uniquely in a moment, basically what you do, you add all the direct sums and cones and direct sums and cones. What did you put on, on top? Of? A little circle to distinguish notationally C and C. So like this is a small... This. So, functorially, it's characterized as follows. So if you're given C0, well, this end C circle, C0, will be co-complete. And when you talk about functors between co-complete categories, you can talk about those functors that take direct sums to direct sums. These functors are called continuous. So continuous functors from this end completion to a, an arbit arbitrary target complete category C are the same as, well, let me call funct. Co-complete, you mean DG, etc. Uh, yes. Co-complete, well, co-complete, completeness is a property of the triangulate level. It's just you have direct, arbitrary direct sums. And this would be an equivalence in the world of... Yes, again, so these are, yes, these funct form a space and it's an equivalence of spaces. But a space is a fiction set? Again, and this depends on your model. Ah, okay, so there is a, a huge... Uh... Functorially in C. So, so we have two operations. One is going from a co-complete category to the subcategory of compact objects, and another from a small category C0 to the int completion. So I want to explain in what sense these two procedures are inverses of each other. They're not quite inverses, but almost. So to give an object in the int completion, is it always something of the form like the inductive limit of some filter yes. system? Yes. You well, the filter system is not uh, a strict one, but with a uh, higher... Uh, so the yes, so it's a, it's a, it's a filtered co-limit, but the category of indices is a higher category. Ah, it must be a higher category. Yes, yeah, so you need to higher categories as your index, as your indices to create all these co-limits. Ah, some kind of filter, I guess. Yes. Okay, so I want to say in what sense these operations are, do, mutual inverse. So here's the definition. It's a very, very important one. Uh, Co-complete category said to be compactly generated. If the following happens, if you take 
the subcategory of compact objects and look at what is right orthogonal to it. So all the objects such that home into them from compact guys are zero. Compactly generated means if this orthogonal is nothing. So if, if an object is right orthogonal, it receives no home from compact objects, then this object is, is zero. So this definition, I believe, is due to Thomason. And there was a beautiful paper of Thomason's where it's used. Okay, so... So the theorem is as follows. So if you start with arbitrary co-complete category, you take the subcategory of compact objects and take the end. If it map back to C is fully faithful, and let me say A prime is an equivalence. if and only if C is compactly generated. So most categories that you encounter in practice are compactly generated. And so it tells you how to reconstruct C from compact objects. And B, so in the opposite direction, the map from C0 to the following. So let's take the int completion of C0 and let's take compact objects there. It's not an equivalence, but this functor realizes as C not car. Do you guys know what car means? Karubi. Yeah, it's the Karubi completion of this. Add all the images of all that impotence. Okay, so our co of S is like the C0. And I will really want to consider int co of S, which is by definition int of co. In fact, the co this is something in general can say that int uh, into this category C0 is the same as functors from opposite categories right. to complex. Okay, let me give an exercise. Exercise number one. It's a, it's a great exercise. In fact, it follows from something that's already written on the blackboard that you can describe it very, very concretely as follows. As Maxim says, these are functors from take C0, take its op, these are vect. Vect is our, the category of vector spaces, but in the DG world. So complexes of vector spaces. So for some reason, I want to pass to the int completion. So why? So in fact, I am interested in coherent objects. Why do you bother to incomplete? So it's, well, the reason is that it just so happens that it's much more convenient to work with this incompletion. The analogy is, so imagine yourself an ancient Greek, and one day someone came to you and said, oh, let's introduce negative numbers. But why do you care? Well, after all, negative number, well, it's an abstraction. We're interested to count our apples. But, so, kind of, you want to account for the fact that 5 minus 7 is 8 minus 10 or something. And you don't want to keep, to be, keep writing this all the time. It's, and it's the same kind of thing that Intco buys you. So, is there any assumption of C0 then? Exercise 1, what is C0? None, just a small category, small digit category. Over, over K? Over, over K. K, yes, we are. And uh, uh, in fact, in some digit category, it's complicated story. So, what, so but you have to know what it means, fact C0 or to... Yeah. Well, yes, so... It's a world of DG categories and functors between them, and they also form a DG category. 
So you, you so somehow the inductive system of X i, well roughly, should go the factor represented by it, yes? One from Y to X. The limit of one from it's very close to Brown's representability theorem, so this, this thing. Yeah, but these are the naive DG functors, right? No, no, no it's, it's the same thing to you. Okay. Yes, yeah, so it's functors in our world. So let me, by the way, give an example of this situation. So if C is A mod, where A is an algebra, so C is compactly generated. So if one wants to find the rigorous uh, uh, a regular statement, it falls out the next that you need a rigorous definition of things. So, do, so we, should go, we should go to the references you mentioned, like Lurie or... Yes, you should. So for this, you should go to... Uh, it's Lurie's books 5.4 uh, 5 and 5.5. 5. But you did not open it. No, I opened it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I opened it. <laughs> Pardon? Van Michel van den Berg. Yeah, so. So this is an example of a compactly generated category. By the way, let's prove it. Who, who knows the proof? So why is it the case that no objects here are right orthogonal to compact guys? Which models over? Oh, for an associative algebra. Yes. Okay. So we have a good student here. So here is a compact object, namely A itself. Home from A is the forgetful functor. So home from A is the forgetful functor from A mod to vect. This functor is conservative, therefore nothing gets sent to zero. So you don't need to look at all compact objects, as one compact object is enough. So, particularly as you apply point A prime of this theorem, you obtain that ind of perf of S maps isomorphically to quasi-co. And now we're introducing a new guy. I call it ind co of S. Which is, if you wish, well, I just definition. It, it's not something that you know a priori. It's just a new guy. So let me play a little bit with this. So we have this int co, and we have the old quasi co. And first, I claim there's a canonically defined map. I call it psi of S. So all the definitions on the blackboard, let's play a game. So who will define this map for me? Yeah, oh, you know it. So somebody who doesn't, hasn't seen this before, would you be able to define this map for me? Just, just using the stuff on the blackboard. No, that's not true. Co does not map to op compact objects in quasi Co. Yeah? Co is not contained. Co is compact objects in quasi Co is perf. Co is not contained. Yeah, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. So uh, ah, but you don't need compact objects. I don't need compact objects. Yeah, apply this where C0 is co and C0 is quasi and C is quasi co. We want a functor in this direction, but we do have a functor from co to quasi co, just embed. So this is your psi. What well, X is this one? Well, yes. Well, it's construction. So we have this functor. Let me just say that so, so observation is that int co has a T structure such that this 
functor psi is t exact. And not only and defines and it defines an equivalence from int co s plus to quasi co s plus. So these are well usual notation things that um, bounded uh, bounded below. So the only difference between these two categories is somehow at minus infinity. And you can wonder, how can this be relevant? So I said at the beginning, it's all about divergence of spectral sequence. So it's really kind of the tails of our categories are different and everything else is similar. And you can ask, how is it possible that this is of any use? I mean, what's the... Can you be more precise about this? So when you say bound from below, you have, there is some bound on the cohomology sheet, let us say, at minus n. Okay. Are you working with a fixed bound, or you are saying... No. Are you taking int of co... No, no, no. Plus means the following. Plus is... I can say... It's, it's an equivalence right. on these guys for every n. And so... So ah, so the hearts are equivalent. Hearts are equivalent. Everything is equivalent. The tails are different. Oh, first, sorry. Can you ask okay, it? So you take first, so you take co s, then you take b is equal to minus n, and then you take end of this. No, 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 I don't take end. So plus means it's just the naive union of these guys for all n. That's what plus means. When you write end co s, there's a special parenthesis. I'm mm. sorry for the pedantic. No, no, no. Int co, no. When I define int co, I don't refer to any t structure. When I write co, I, I said it last time, co means bounded complexes with coherent cohomologies. Right. Yeah, so when I define int co, I don't refer to any t-structure. Ah, so you take int co and then you use a t-structure on int co. Yeah, I claim that it has a canonically defined t-structure, which is in fact uniquely extended from the t-structure on co. Ah, but of course if you put biggest label to minus n, it is no longer a triangulated category. It's not, of course. But in some sense, it should be the case that int co bigger than equal to minus n. But in some sense, int of co has... You can say that. So int makes sense not just in the triangular context. Int makes sense in just general in infinity categorical context. Yeah. And it's completely true. It's true that this is the int completion of co greater than equal than minus n. In the sense... Uh... So int makes sense always. It's, it's a general procedure in, in infinity categories. Ind makes sense always in infinity categories. Okay. Okay, next question to the audience. Again, for those who haven't seen it before. I want a function in the opposite direction. Who will give it to me? Don't be afraid. What? Yeah. Come on. Is it that there doesn't perf go into... Uh, okay, Michael says, perf go... So Michael says this. Quasi-co is int perf. Int co is int co. Map perf to co and int extend. Is that what you're saying? Yes or no? I don't want to say no, 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 no. <laughs> we have witnesses here. Okay, I think we s he said that. So I'll call, define, I call this functor xi, and xi is just, well, it just embed into co, and then in extend. Okay, let's consider an example. I'll give you a de def derived scheme. S is spec k of generator xi. Xi lives in degree negative 2. I'll give you an object here, which is just the structure shift O. And you want to send it to itself, kind of. But it's not coherent. It lives in infinitely many cohomological degrees. I didn't say anything. <laughs> You're right. So it's, it's, it's not going to work. <sighs> like this. It's not coherent. So S is not, the structure shift is not coherent. So definition, 
S is eventually co-connective, if the structure sheet has finitely many cohomologies. So for I large. So example, well, example zero, anything which is classical is eventually co-connective. But what's important for us is quasi-smooth guys are. This is exercise two. So remember, quasi-smooth schemes can be locally written in this Cartesian product, and using that you should be able to do exercise two. This is a counterexample. This is not counterexample, this is a guy which is not eventually co-connective. So this notion of eventual co-connectiveness is useful. So let me just state one thing. Well, kind of tautological, but makes one appreciate more. So if you have a map of derived schemes, so there is strict this kind of whatever you call it, the psi s, the, the function in the other direction. Xi. Xi you call it? Yeah. So is it only when s is only only then? It's yeah. I I'll, I'll go back to that in a moment. I just want to So let F be morphism between these derived schemes, again we are almost finite type, then F is of finite tor dimension if and only if its fibers So you should think of the failure of eventual connectivity as the failure of uh, having finite or dimension. Uh, uh, prove this, that quasi-smooth are eventually co-connective. So let me go back to these functors. So the claim is that they are mutually adjoint, form an adjoint pair. And B is that this Xi guy is fully faithful. Oh, just eventually co-connective. The condition that the Xi exists. And so this is actually a very important point. You have this pair of adjoint functors with this being fully faithful. This is called the situation of co-localization. So Xi allows you to view quasi co as subcategory here, but Psi allows you to view it as a quotient category, and you use these both points of view all the time. So it's a sub, but at the same time it's some kind of coarsening. So it's actually a quotient of this by by something which is also very explicit. And a lot of mistakes are made by... So when you... This is in the infinity world of course. So I mean the world of... the word quotient? No, no, the subcategory. Fully faithful is not usual category. No, fully faithful means that a func so a functor defines a map between mapping spaces well, homes before were sets, now they are the 
harm between two objects now is a space. Functor is fully faithful is this map of spaces and is an isomorphism. Well, isomorph is in the category spaces, which is homotopy equivalence. Okay, but did you say when you have C or? You yes, eventually co-connective. Oh, okay. You said, yeah. Co That's what I thought. When S is a spectrum of a ordinary <coughs> ring, algebra, K algebra. No, no, okay, but well, well, could you make more explicit this diagram? Even more explicit than that? No, but you say quasi cos or that. So that's a module. Yes. So this is something. So this is something we know. And yes, let me just say one more thing. So the, let me just say one more thing. So I said that this is the quotient of this. It's a Verdier quotient by something. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. It's a quotient by what? So the kernel of psi is all those objects. such that, remember, we had a t-structure. So this t-structure here is degenerate. So there are, are objects that, all of whose cohomologies are zero in this t-structure, but the objects are non-zero. So for that reason, this, this kernel is some kind of phantoms. And, and again, you can go back and ask, how can these phantoms be relevant, but I'll, in a moment I'll give you a, a concrete example. For example, here's a question, how do you feel a phantom? Like I want to... I give you an object in the kernel, I want to... can I produce a number out of it? Like something very tangible, and we'll do it in a moment. So it's actually possible to like really get a handle on this kernel. This kernel sounds to be in the right of problem. Uh, by definition, in this situation, the kernel is right orthogonal to the essential image of this. And now HI is in the sense of... What is that, that is... No, we, I said that this category has a T-structure. So it's HI with respect to that, the T-structure that I said existed on int co. Ah, T-structure. Okay. But can one interpret it as a, as a quasi coherent shift on the classical... Uh, a classical scheme, and then let's say zero as a classic relationship of the classical. Because as far as I understand that maybe I make that for any uh, thing in your category is like quasi co or co, you can associate cohomology shifts which are actual uh, uh, quasi coherent or coherent shifts on the classical scheme. Oh, no, the, the thing? No, no. I'm just, so just to avoid missing that thing. So if I've got a class, a something in Q co or co S. Yes. Uh, so I, as far as I understand, so it is some uh, differential graded thing, mm -hmm. you know, but the, it's cohomology, it has cohomology shapes which are classical Absolutely. OS quasi coherent or coherent modules. Yes. Okay. Now, is it the case that the T structure in question has to, it does not relate it to this, in other words. It, 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 well, in some sense, it is related to this. This T structure is the end extension of the T structure on Co. Which is the one that I've said. Which is the one you said. So, in other words, is it enough for something in end Co? Can I just associate? A H I, which is a classical, absolutely, and say that this is zero is the same. Is it is your condition that just this one is zero as a classical quasi coherent shift, or is it something? Else? Yes, it is. And moreover, y the answer to your question is already contained here. I said that. So, Offer is asking this very good question. So he has asked, can I think of this individual cohomologies as really coherent shifts in the abelian category? Here's how you do it. You apply this functor psi, you go here, and take cohomologies. And we said that psi is t exact, so it's the same thing as take cohomologies upstairs. So the answer is yes. The only thing that there are objects there, all of whose cohomologies in this sense are zero, and yet the objects are non-zero. So this T structure is what's called non-separated. 
Now, suppose that I want to go zero to minus infinity to plus infinity. So can you have, so I don't see why that if the H I have zero and the limit, all the sequence of coherent. Ah, so you, you want to produce a counterexample of something. Tell me of what, and maybe I'll help you. Uh, because uh, you, some of you've learned the topology God is in minus infinity. Yes. Uh, and not in yes, I'm saying that this functor is an equivalence every time you're bounded from below. I'll give one more example, you'll see, maybe you'll see. I'll, okay, so here's a question to ask. If I were offer, I would ask, can you give me an example of an object in the kernel? Is that what you're asking? No, no, I first tried to find a pathology at plus infinity, but I don't understand it, it shouldn't exist. Yeah, but all, there's no pathology at plus infinity. Okay. But maybe the next question is to produce an example. Yeah. I'll give you one. Quite easy, I think. <laughs> I'll give you an example in a moment. Okay. Um, let me do this example and then we'll make a break. So, as I said, there's one example that I find particularly illuminating, and it's when S is my favorite point times point over V, i.e. it's spectrum of sim V of 1. And so here is the complete picture. So int co of S is isomorphic now you take all modules, no perfection condition. So int co is all of this thing. Quasi co, as we said last time, is modules with support at zero. So our xi well, it's just the tautological embedding. And this functor is the right adjoint, and it's taking, how do you call it, cohomology with supports or something. It's the right adjoint. Like if you have a, a variety in the subvariety, closed subvariety, there's a functor adjoint to the embedding of the full category of sheaves set theoretically supported in your subvariety. So taking cohomology with support, and that's, that's the right adjoint, that's what it looks like. So for example, here is an, an example of an object that lives in the kernel of this psi s. So if you take um, v to be one dimensional, then we are dealing with sim, well, It's polynomials of eta. Degree eta is 2, not to be confused with that xi where degree was negative 2. So a typical module will be chi, k of eta, eta inverse. So this is a typical guy that will vanish under this functor. So what is the relation, what is the factor from co-s that you're explaining to C and V minus the model? Oh, this is our causal duality from last time. I'll say it in a moment. So causal duality, let me call it our home from the skyscraper. It's also basic caucus modules, not in support of what's on exterior algebra. By definition, they are, they start life as modules of their exterior algebra, but then you apply causal duality and you look where they go to as modules of symmetric algebra, they go not all modules, but these kind of modules. 
Is it similar to uh, in, in the SGA there is something wh why you, you have the quasi-coherent uh, sheaf that you embed into all the sheaf and there is an adjoint? I mean, all sheaves meaning um, all sheaves meaning not quasi coherent. Not quasi coherent. Yeah. It's not the same, but it's, it, is remin it has some similarity. What does that work is similar to completely in degree zero? You can see the scheme and sub called subset, you can see the sheaves support on subset. Just in degree zero, or we can put everything in degree zero, we get the same two structures. <laughs> but I want to finish this hour by something tangible. Uh, that was not good. So let's be in this example, but now let's consider categories of modules equivariant with respect to the action of GM by dilations. So we can consider int co of, well, it's our S. And, well, you can take it either the quotient or it's equivalent to the kernel of psi. GM equivariant. So our phantoms. And the claim is that this is equivalent to quasi-coherent sheaves on the projectivization of V star. So it's something very, very concrete. If you wanted a number, well, it's not exactly a number, but it's a coherent, it's actual quasi-coherent sheaf on something classical. So e.g., if the dimension of v is 1, then the above quotient, so the kernel psi, if you consider G, the GM equivariant category, it's just vect. So here, if you wish, you get kind of numbers. So it's a really kind of tangible way to quantify the difference. So let me finish by giving the following definition. So let n be let S be quasi-smooth and let S be a conical uh, subset in SING. So then we have the following categories. So we have int co, we have quasi-co, which is in int perf, but you also have something in between that I denote int co n, and that is by definition int co sub n, where this was defined last time as coherent sheaves with support on n. So this is by definition int co, and this was theorem, but an easy one, int perf. And as before, we have these embeddings because the corresponding categories of compact objects just naturally embed to each, to each other. And now it's a general theorem of Lurie's that these functors always admit right adjoints. So, so this int co is what is the category of interest and it's connected to the more classical category by this pair of adjoint functors and to the bigger category of int co by a pair of adjoint functors. And again, it's very easy to make mistake, so because you can think of int co in two different, well, four different ways, sub quotient, sub quotient, and you really have to make sure that you know, are you thinking it uh, as a sub or as a quotient or something? Um, okay, so let's make a break and then we'll continue. We are interested in int co on the stack of local systems and I thought that I should well say something about that first I should say what it means to be int co of an algebraic stack 
and so and also how is log cis an algebraic stack? Is it an algebraic stack or a derived stack? Yes, from now on everything is derived. And that causes some troubles. I mean, okay, so int coven algebraic stack may be a little bit boring, but let me go through it nonetheless. Uh, so, first of all, for this and for many other things, we don't want to restrict ourselves to... Let me first talk about quasi-co. So I want to define what it means for quasi-co when y is an algebraic stack, but it really makes no sense to restrict ourselves to algebraic stacks. What we want to take y is an arbitrary pre-stack. And what that means, it's a completely arbitrary functor from affine schemes I mean derived affine schemes to groupoids. Not well, exactly. I want representable functors to be, well, I want my schemes to be among pre stacks. Now, home between schemes is an infinity groupoid because we're in infinity category. So you've got to include. In, in Call it spaces, therefore. Okay, so what does it mean to have quasi-co on a pre-stack? Well, naively, what you want to say is for every s, with kind of, for every s point little y of y, you want to attach. So to specify. an object of quasi-co on the pre-stack. So to every s point little y of y, you want to attach an object of quasi-co and s, thought of as the pullback. And every time you have s1 goes to s2, so let, let's call this little y, let's call this f, let's denote by y1 the composition, to every situation like this, you want to attach an isomorphism bet between f upper star of f s2 y2 with what you've got on s1 itself. And of course, every time you have a threefold, comp twofold composition, so let's it be f and g, it'll be y3 what are you going to have? So it'll be f upper star g upper star f y3. Okay, let me write it once and for all. So on the one hand, it'll be so our datum for this composition identifies it with f s1 y1 this is f upper star f s2 y2 and then so you have these maps now we're so therefore the two circuits to go from here to here these are maps between objects in a higher category you want to spe specify a homotopy then you want something for th four objects and then you give up and that's how um, homotopy th Right, but <laughs> so, so who gives up? No, no, no. Who gives up? You give up. I give up. <laughs> so no, no, it's three. Really so yeah. you don't have a notion of five category in this infinity story? Yes, I do what I do. I put my hand on Luri's book, <laughs> and I do, th and I say this. Sorry. None, none, just pre stacks. <laughs> so what I say is this. Well, it's exactly as Ahmed is saying. Uh, so there is a functor from affine schemes opposite 
to well digicat this functor is s goes to quasi co you have to believe in the existence of this functor then you have the category of affine schemes over y so it's pairs s comma little y there's a forgetful functor forget the map to y so you've got a functor from here to here and then then you define quasi co of y say this word it's a limit let's call this functor quasi co so limit over this category of indices of this functor and it's an object in digicat so this is one of the things that the theory of higher categories is good for uh, no what uh, what the precise statement it's this is one of the reasons it's good that this theory exists you don't have to think about the definition you just write it and never think about it um, well, but then the, there are questions of how do you compute it. So, for example, you can take y to be an algebraic stack and you can um, compare this definition with one in the book of uh, Le Monde and Morebe. So, what is true? So, remark that if y is algebraic, What you know is that, well, there is always a t-structure, kind of for any pre-stack there is a t-structure. So this is definition. On this bounded below part you get what you always did. On the entire category I have no idea and there is no reason to believe that they are the same. No, but I, I don't understand exactly. So if you have a usual algebraic stack, mm -hmm. or even a scheme, I mean, so you have some group of it, it's a small group of it that represent it. So you can just, so the usual notion. I'll say it in a moment. Okay, so you just consider shapes and those things, but here you allow uh, oh. anything that maps to yeah. it, and you allow to consider some shapes without the, the pullback that you don't request that, that that when you have pullbacks, or do you request this? So, that if you have S, S1 to S2... Isomorphism. Uh, ah, in the derived sense, of course. Yes. Ah, okay, okay. But then, so, I circumvent the question of how you homotopy glue by writing this. Mm -hmm. ah, so, it's a problem with very <coughs> stabilizers. Yeah, it's like a magic form. It's usual scheme. Should be the same, yeah? Quite yeah. Oh, in this sense, yeah. As, same as what? I don't know. No, the usual, usual scheme, of course, you'll get the same thing, but if, even algebraic, on the algebraic stack, I don't know what their definition will give at minus infinity. But uh, your yes. goal is to, to do something on lock sys. Yes. A local system on uh, a curve, a G local system. Yeah. So what is the problem? Uh, you cannot stay classical in some sense? Uh, I, I won't be able to. So, I, I'll, I will get there. In, we'll, yeah. Um, no, but at least uh, this, the stack is classical. No. Right. It's, for P1, it's not. When you get to H2. Yeah, you will, we'll see that in a moment. So, it's true if the group is semi simple, the curve is genus greater than 2, then the stack will be classical in this case. However, when you want to prove something about it, you go oh, through. Okay. Loxis Borel, and that is never classical. No, no, but at least uh, we can understand the statement. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, so you can give this definition, even you can restrict yourself to classical schemes, and I will still give the same definition. The problem of gluing st persists. So this definition is, you can do it in the derived setting or in the classical setting. So can you, in general, a uh, derived stack, so a usual stack can be represented by some simplicia logic object yeah. of less algebraic spaces, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, can one uh, uh, derived star, can it be represented some kind of simplicial object of... Derived, derived, you mean derived art and stack? Derived art and stack, is it a simplicial of... Yes, yeah, D so by definition, so, let's see, when I say algebraic stack, I mean one art and stack, and those are, this, you say the same words, 
you just cover by derived schemes in the same, and then it's, it's just exactly the same as in the classical theory. There are different ways to generalize that. You can also consider higher stacks, but you are, you are considering... I, I, will, I will say in a moment. Okay, maybe, maybe it's a good point to say it. So definition, so let me, be, I'll, I'll be slightly more restrictive than general. So an algebraic stack algebraic derived stack is a pre-stack with the following properties such that first of all it satisfies a tall descent and two uh, there exists a derived scheme S equipped with a smooth map with a schematic smooth map. So schematic means that if you base change it by a scheme, you get a derived scheme. Schematic. Okay. So I'm skipping. So properly, I should have, I should have started from algebraic spaces. So I don't. To this point, it is subjective. Uh, yes, yes, uh, subjective, schematic, mm, smooth, subjective. Ah, okay. So you are not. And so this is the. So I have not followed exactly the literature. I know that some people even in the career work on it, but then what is the general definition of the live stack? Is it like what you have written, this is the right spaces, or do they consider a more general, uh, like higher? Okay, here's a system of definition that I like. I define uh, pre-stacks. So first of all, when I, say, when I say derived stack, I impose descent condition. Uh, say a tall descent condition yeah. and then so okay th let's call these guys derived stacks and now there's a notion of k art and stack these guys are defined inductively as follows so for for, for k equals negative one so i mean they're, they're very so let's say for k ne negative one derived Art and K stacks are derived schemes. And then you proceed by induction. So each time, so if you, so Y is a K art and stack if it admits a map from a derived schemes such that this map is, such that the fibers of this map are K minus one art and stacks. That means that if you base change it by another derived scheme, this fiber product Um, well, you, you want this map to be, so, this, yeah, yeah, so you want this to be a k minus 1 art and stack, and by definition, and then by induction it makes sense to require that this map be smooth and surjective. So it's kind of inductive definition. Okay. Uh, Gabriel, is it that reasonable scheme to define? And, uh, the the, the pre-stacks are in value in spaces? What, what yes. What, what means this? Uh, infinity groupoids and then yeah so this is a reasonable scheme of definitions so what we'll be dealing will be algebraic guys algebraic is is k art and for a k equals one and here I gave well I don't like the scheme of definitions I just did it for brevity I rec Normally, I should require this map not be schematic, but the fibers should be algebraic spaces. But I require something stronger. You should start with algebraic spaces instead of schemes. Right? I should, for aesthetical reasons, I should actually do first algebraic spaces, then, then algebraic stacks. But here, I just I skipped. Okay. 
So how do you, but it seems that there is on, you only go from zero to one when you pass from algebraic spaces to start, it is one step. So, but in your, you said it's plus minus one to one. I, here I skipped, but I, shall we proceed? I think it's pretty clear now, or do you, do you still have a question? So the true scheme of definition is as follows. D define derived schemes, define al derived algebraic spaces, and then de define one derived one art and stack. And then by induction. And then by induction. I mean, you can start the induction from m minus one already. So if you start with minus one derived scheme, and at zero you get derived algebraic spaces, or more, more general? Uh, yeah, maybe so I have to start from zero, yes. So derived, derived algebraic spaces, you require the map to be et al. But etal descent, uh, is it complicated to define? No. No, it's just the usual. Thing. It's the usual, yes. But the only thing that, so let me just say it, just to yeah. convey the spirit of things. So etal descent means the following, that if you have a, so this is, um, so there's a notion of etal map between affine um, derived schemes. Then you form this check nerve, and, and then you require that y of s, so this is a groupoid, the infinity groupoid, then you have this, this is a co-simplicial infinity groupoid, you take its limit over the category delta, and you require that this map, so it's limit in the category of infinity groupoids, i.e. spaces, and you require that this map be an, equi an isomorphism in the category of spaces. So that's the definition. It's a little bit frightening, but I mean, it kind of, you, one has to follow one's nose. I mean, it, there are no, it's difficult to give a wrong definition here. You just proceed. Because in the, a long time ago, you were afraid of convergence problems. <laughs> so, um, uh, for what, for coherent sheaves or for these guys? In general, when you do infinite, I don't know. <coughs> no, I mean, it's. Yes, however, I wanted to say one thing. And so it's going back to our first question. So we've got this general definition of quasi-co. So observation. Let y be algebraic. So initially, for an arbitrary stack, I took all S's, that's as Offer protested, said it took all, all schemes mapping to Y. But for algebraic, one can consider, one can replace by, by smaller category. So one can take the limit, one can replace the limit. So here we took over the category of all affine schemes over y, opposite. But, so, you can consider another category that maps to this index category. You can consider affine schemes, let me call it smooth over y. So, it's a full subcategory here. And you have a limit over the category, and another category maps to it, this limit maps to the smaller limit. And the claim is that this limit will be, it will be an isomorphism. So you don't, it's enough to consider all these schemes that map smoothly, but even more so, you can take smooth over y, but you can take a non-full subcategory there, you require that the map between the schemes themselves be smooth. So you don't need, so not only these S's map smoothly to Y, these F's between the S's are also smooth. And it's, it's going to be the same, uh, the limit, the map between the limits will be an isomorphism. And you can also work with a simplicial object or a strict simplicial object. Strict meaning? Uh, without degeneracy. Yes, and that's, 
Yeah. I mean, the map between S and the classical uh, thing. So. Classical? No, when you say the, the double smooth, so you have smooth over S in the derived sense? Yes, yeah, smooth over S in the derived And then, furthermore, in the middle thing, I allow arbitrary maps between the S's, uh -huh. and the ultim ultimate thing, I'm... Re okay, I'm okay, between them. Between them. Mm -hmm. Smooth in the derived sense means you can form at finitely many variables in non-positive degrees, yeah? No, in degree zero. Smooth means smooth. Smooth and schematic. What is, what is, no, what is smooth in the right sense? Um, so, great question. Smooth over point, yeah, what is smooth? Smooth over point, we had this definition. It means classical and smooth. So you mean smooth uh, uh, in the sense of actually schematic? Smooth is just... Ah, no, so, it's like... Ah, so you do something called in degree zero, yeah? Yeah, uh, there were two questions here. Um, if you have a map between art and stacks, it may make sense to talk about a map being smooth. I mean, cover enough, so you can reduce the question of smoothness of maps between art and stacks to a question, you can test it by a certain map between schemes. But is it the case that the notion of smooth always means... It doesn't mean schematic. It could be algebraic space, for example. Even so, you can say, you can talk about the... Let's forget derived algebraic geometry, you can take an just classical algebraic stack, it makes sense for it to be smooth over a point. Ah, yeah, this I know, so you get more general. Yeah, so that's what I mean. When I say smooth, I mean in, in this sense. Ah, okay, so here smooth over Y is in the sense which is more general than what you say in the definition. Yes, but if I, if I stick to algebraic spaces, uh, algebra, in the, to this definition, any map from a scheme, a, so in this definition, any map from a scheme to my stack is already schematic. So that's why I gave this definition. So in this definition, any map from a scheme is already schematic. Therefore, it kind of the definition of what it maps, what it means for this map to be smooth is, auto is automatic. It's already it's a schematic map. When I say scheme, I mean derived scheme. And then you say schematic, you allow derived schematic. Yeah, yeah. So the bike space as well. In the Wait, no, no, let's say schematic is schematic. Ah, because if you have one guy which maps onto it, which is schematic, yes, that doesn't mean it. that the other one, why right? for the other one you don't get measured by space? Uh, that's true. Sorry, my bad. R require schematic diagonal. Not, it really doesn't matter here. So, okay, let's, let's, let's do the proper definition. Let's do it by induction. So in this case, it will be an algebraic space, and then it makes sense, for, it makes sense to say what it means for a map of algebraic spaces to be, schemat uh, to be smooth. Yeah, I yes. okay, okay. No, but if you have two, two, two classical schemes, a map between them is uh, smooth. Oh, it, 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 it map between them is smooth? Classical it's a classical definition. Let me answer Maxime's question what it means for a map between derived schemes to be smooth. So, um, um, so, well, we are in finite type. Uh, definition F is smooth if and only if if its fibers, in the derived sense, are classical, um, uh, classical smooth schemes. Note that I'm taking fibers in the derived sense, so therefore flatness is absorbed already. And as Maxim says, it means that after a tal base change, you just a tal locally smooth means that you're crossing with an the usual an. All right. Hmm. I'm very glad that you didn't. This didn't put you to sleep, but on the contrary, I thought with people just oh my god, all your break stacks. Um, Okay, so now let me let me define intco
Well, I will only define it for now for algebraic stacks or k artin stacks. The reason is that we'll enhance the formulas, but for now we can only we can only do this. Namely, if you have a map uh, between schemes, what is f upper star? I wanted to map from And if the map is smooth, this is easy to say what it is. It's just you take, if the map is smooth, or more generally, a finite or dimension, if you do f upper star, it maps co to co, and it does if and only if the map is a finite or dimension. And then you index tend. And if the map is not a finite or dimension, there is a little theorem that tells you that it's actually impossible to define in it with any reasonable properties. So, pardon? In, in each sense, it's it's the, the same as here. So, so, int co is a functor out of the category of affine schemes and smooth maps between them. Okay. And then I. Specify one for memory in such a way that you get the full so let me give you the preview. So f upper star will actually fail for arbitrary morphisms. What will happen, what will exist as f upper shriek. So int co is good for f upper shriek. And we'll talk about it in detail next time. And there's a, there's a theory with a lot of content with this upper shriek. So let me, I want to test the level of alertness. I'll write a theorem which one of which points will be false i want to see if anybody will catch me pardon a dual of inco a dual in the sense so everything every functor has to have a dual so <laughs> a dual in what sense a lurie sense <laughs> if there's no f star in, <laughs> you say uh, th i mean will We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it, so I kind of, let me do it. For, the, for our current goal, this, this is good enough, and then we'll... Okay, so let me also say that you define perf. Same thing, perf of S. Uh, you define... Co of y so proposition again this is defined for algebraic stacks Who is happy and who is not? <laughs> I define separately int co as that limit, or I can define co as the limit and then take the end of that. For schemes, it's okay. Yeah, for schemes, it's okay. For stacks, it's completely false. All of it. 
Okay, so let me tell you when this is true. Uh, so what you really need is, so y is quasi-compact affine stabilizers. So in this case it's known. Okay, so this is, this statement makes sense for arbitrary pre-stacks. It's completely false for arbitrary pre-stacks. So let me say what is true. So let me... And here, why is a finite path as you said over... Uh, so for this statement, I mean, this only makes sense in, for, in finite type. I mean, we only define co in finite type. Almost finite type. Almost finite type. This you can define in general. It will be completely false. So let me say what is true. Uh, so let y be quasi-compact with affine stabilizers. So in this case, let me call it B prime, it is true that the perf of y is contained in quasi co. So that much is true that these perfect guys, as are defined here, are actually compact. And I want to say that it's an the, uh, the functor. Well, actually, it's sorry. It's an equality. So then I can ask if it's true that ind of perf of y is an equivalence, and I don't really know. It's certainly conjectured. There is something lurking in the back of my mind that I recently saw a paper that proved that. Do you guys, does anybody know? So, under some mild conditions. So it's certainly conjectured that this is true, but it's not known. It's true in many, many cases. So in many cases, you can explicitly prove it, in particular for low cis and stuff like this. But I don't think it's known in general. So th there, are, there are some pitfalls. So. When you say affine stabilizers, <laughs> is it over every point? Yeah, uh, ge geometric point. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, okay. yeah it's really. It's kind of like Rundon van der Berg's theorem. Which? No, it's a sketchable question here. It's, 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 it's perfect generator, yeah? Oh, it's kind of similar. It's not perfect, global perfect. Point. Yeah, it's true for schemes. So, so this is this is van der Berg. For algebraic stacks, it's just not, I, I don't think it's known. Finally, what is the statement of the proposition? So B is false? B is false. This is true. So this is true, this is true, and this is unknown. Uh, you ah, could so proposition false, before. It's not unknown, yeah, it's, it's not false, it's unknown. Yeah, no, see, this is true, this is true, this is unknown. No, but let us so let me just separate it like this. I just, sorry, so I, I just wrote it this way to kind of, to, again, to draw your attention that it's not, such things are not for granted. To put you in a usual scheme and without uh, Without the right, then without the stack. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not sure what are you saying because it's, it's difficult to find enough per global perfect complex. It's, a, it's a non trivial theorem. It, 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 it is Van der Berg. It's quasi compact and quasi separated. Quasi separated, yes. Then, then it's true. Bondan and Van der Berg. Quasi compact and quasi separated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you say that in general perfect complex might not mm -hmm. even be compact? No, uh, in general meaning... <laughs> you wrote the inclusion. <laughs> yeah, so... The inclusion... Yeah, inclusion is false for arbitrary pre-stacks. So, to have the inclusion... Yeah. Yeah. So, even if you have... Take the following scheme. Infinitely many... Disjoint unit, infinitely many points. O will not be compact there. Already there. So... Quasi compactness is, nest, is kind of essential. All right. Oh, wow. I'm really behind the schedule. 
Okay, so let me finish with a few definitions. So let y be algebraic stack or if you feel comfortable with k art and stacks you can do it k, k art and stack yes everything is derived and always assuming almost a finite type locally and all this means is that the schemes by which you smoothly cover are most of finite type. So definition y is quasi smooth if for every little y which is a k valued point so we have the following hi of the tangent fiber is zero for i greater than two greater or equal than two just notice that if you're dealing with k art and stacks um, the cohomology will live from degree negative k to infinity so um, negative k is k stack if if um, if y is a k art and stack I'm sorry. So if algebraic stacks, it will be from minus 1 to infinity. So from minus 1 to 0, this is these cohomology are responsible for automorphisms. And from 0 to infinity, like in the case of schemes for singularities. So we're interested to bound the singularities. We don't care to bound the automorphisms. So this is quasi-smoothness. Equivalently, Um, y is quasi smooth if for every scheme S that covers Y smoothly, for every such that F is smooth, S is quasi smooth. So quasi smooth means that if you cover by a smooth scheme, that scheme must be smooth. So you define sing of y in the same way. It's a classical k art and stack defined the same way. It's a kind of um, spec, relative spec of sim of the tangent shifted cohomologically by one. And you notice the following, that if you have a scheme mapping smoothly, oh, sorry, H1. I'm sorry. Just as before. So you'll notice that in this case, um, it's, what is it? It's one artist stack, usual one artist stack. Well, it's k artist n artist stack if y was an n, n artist stack. It's classical n artist stack. So it's it's schem it is schematic over over y. So if in this situation where f is smooth, if you pull back the sing of y to s, you'll recover sing of s. 
maybe I should have said in general that if you have a smooth map, smooth, smooth map between quasi-smooth schemes, that in general, sing of S2 over S2 with S1 is sing of S1. A smooth map doesn't change um, the first cohomology of the, of the tangent. So it's smooth in the sense of stacks? Yes, it's... So we have a notion, if you have a k-origin stack, it may s make sense to, for a map from, from a scheme to that to be smooth. So and the compatibility of saying is it for mm -hmm. a smooth map of... Uh, oh, which compatibility? This of saying with... Uh, <coughs> no, the thing is defined for for uh, R for, for quasi smooth for a quasi smooth art and stack. Art and stack, and the compatibility with pullback is for a smooth map of quasi smooth art and stack or for a smooth map. You mean here? No, the thing, the thing S two cross S two S one is thing S one. Is it for a map which is smooth for F which is smooth between from a scheme to an art and stack. Ah, so you, you don't form an outing stack to an outing stack. That is also true. It's, it's also true. Ah, so if you have a smooth map of... If you have a smooth map of outing stacks, the things just pull back. Oh, Quasi-smooth quasi -smooth smooth maps, in which case, that's the only case where things are defined. So the, the things pull back. And is it good to a, so a smooth map, the quasi-smoothness can be tested in <coughs> them and it follows for the other, or...? Yes. So, quasi-smoothness is a property locally smooth topology in every possible sense. So it does not change the cohomologies in H degree? In H1, kind of. H1 of the tangent, if you take the tangent downstairs, take it H1, pull it back, it will be H1 of the tangent upstairs. Because H1 sees only the singularity. So let me, in the remaining one minute, um, so let me give kind of our crucial definition. So let's fix N the risk closed conical in sing of y. And because of these isomorphisms upstairs, we have a well-defined ns in sing s for every s mapping to y. And we define int co of sub n of y to be the full subcategory inside int co of y equal to the same limit over the same index category, but now you'll be taking not entire int cos, but int co sub s. You just limit, well, take the limit of subcategories and full subcategories, and it'll be a full subcategory in the limit. That means that for each uh, test uh, map like that? Uh yeah, I take the subcategory there. And one can again ask the same treacherous question. Is it true that the category is compactly generated? And the answer is B double prime. Sometimes you always have the inclusion in one direction. And sometimes the category is compactly generated by that. In particular, it will be true for log cis. Basically, every time you see a global complete intersection, that will be true. By the way, note that this question is a particular case of that question. Take n to be zero. So if, we, if this was, the answer was positive, the answer would be here positive as well. But again, we don't know, but in most practical applications, it's true. All right. I ran over time, and I still haven't finished my program for the first talk. <laughs>